Are we ready for a night filled with opportunities for Wilmington? Welcome. Welcome to our Imagine Delaware Forum on Wilmington and its schools. I'm Susan Lee, <coughs> President and Publisher of the News Journal Media Group. Why are we here tonight? Wilmington premieres, I mean, Wilmington is Delaware's premier city. Its fate influences all of Delaware. As Wilmington goes, I've heard, so will Delaware. We at the News Journal and Delaware Online believe in Wilmington's tomorrow. We believe that success is within reach for Wilmington. However, a crucial part of that success must come from the schools. That is where the talent is. That is where the dreams will come from. We believe in the future of Wilmington and the role our schools play in that future. And the fact that you guys are here tonight shows you believe that too. Applaud you guys. Our program tonight is aimed at finding solutions. And to help us get started, let me introduce to you someone who's been helping on many fronts. Michelle Taylor and United Way of Delaware are deeply involved in helping young Delawareans and their families in a variety of ways. Michelle has been President and Chief Executive Officer of United Way of Delaware since 2008. She served within United Way in a variety of capacities for eight years. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Accounting from Morgan State University and an MBA from your very own Wilmington University. Michelle understands our community. She has served and continues to serve on a number of boards and commi committees that touches all aspects of Delaware's life, from work for workforce development to uh, the governor's Early Childhood Education Council to Wilmington's Hope Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to introduce you to Michelle Taylor. Good evening. Thank you, Susan, for that warm introduction. United Way of Delaware is pleased to partner with Rodell Foundation to serve as the lead sponsor for tonight's Imagine Delaware Expo and Forum in partnership with the News Journal. At United Way of Delaware, we're committed to helping our young people to realize their full human potential and to give back to the community. As such, to, for tonight, the theme is Imagine Delaware. Imagine with me for a moment. Let's take a moment to imagine a Delaware where every child in our state is socially, cognitively, physically, emotionally, and academically ready to start school, ready to learn. Let us imagine a Delaware where all children read proficiently by third grade. Let's imagine a Delaware where adolescents are armed with the assets needed to support healthy life decisions. Let us imagine a Delaware where our young people are on target to transition successfully into college and or a thriving career path. And let us imagine a Delaware where our future workforce has been provided the skills and education needed to compete both nationally and globally. But more importantly, let us imagine that we, the adults, understand it's going to take all of us working collectively and collaboratively together, united around strategies that truly work. While we may have a lot of conversation this evening and debate about how we arrive at the solutions, I challenge us not to lose sight that at the very center of everything, at the heart of this discussion, lies the well-being of our children. Our kids matter. And while they may represent approximately 22% of our population, they are 100% of our future. 
The choice is ours. The time is now. At this point, I'd like to introduce to you a man that has been instrumental in the development of tonight's event. David Lefferk is Vice President and News Executive Editor of the News Journal and Delaware Online. This is the eighth paper around America at which David has worked, serving a decade in Delaware, his longest tenure of any place. He has also served as president of the Associated Press Managing Editors and helped that nationally group create investigative reporting projects fueled partly with contributions from local communities. It was David who came up with the name Imagine Delaware for the series of a community series forms, believing that it's important for citizens to imagine public policy changes like the ones being discussed tonight to help to improve our state. This is the seventh in a series of community discussions led by the paper and its partners, and David believes that this one has truly captured the imagination of stakeholders. So let us imagine as I, and give a warm welcome to Mr. David Lefford. Thank you, Michelle. When we were talking about all this, uh, Michelle was the one who said, these are all of our children, not just the people in Wilmington. It's the state's children. And I think what Susan said about, as Wilmington goes, so goes Delaware, couldn't be, you couldn't say anything more true than that. It's very important. I want to uh, now introduce uh, our governor, Jack Markell. Uh, who is going to offer his perspective on the issues before we begin our discussion tonight. Uh, Jack is going to have to go in a minute. He and I both were uh, signed up at a deal at Mount Pleasant called Project Citizen that was uh, really important in the civic group of children there. And he's going to stick to his commitment. I got to bail on mine to be with you all tonight. But Jack has uh, was dealt a tough hand when he was elected, uh, took office in 09. Our country was reeling from the financial meltdown, the, the economy had stalled, unemployment shot skyward, and the state's budget struggled. But through the years, Jack made education one of his top priorities, winning President Obama's race to the top competition to improve public schools, helping Delaware become one of the first to receive federal funding in that program. Delaware has put enormous energy into using data to drive decision that lifts achievement scores in our schools that struggle the most. And it was Jack who, through an executive order last year, created the Wilmington Education Advisory Committee, which drafted recommendations that we'll be discussing tonight. <laughs> Governor Markell. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Wonderful to, uh, to be here. I want to thank uh, David Ledford for uh, envisioning this event uh, tonight in the News Journal uh, as a whole, uh, for sponsoring along with the other sponsors as well, to provide this really important opportunity to discuss the issues facing our schools. I also want to thank all the organizations that participated in the expo, and to all of you, this amazing, amazing crowd uh, who have come, come out tonight. Thank you for, for being here. We have quite a few members of the General Assembly who are here. Um, I have not seen all of them, but the ones I've seen include uh, Senator Margaret Rose Henry, uh, Representative Charles Potter, Representative Stephanie Bolden, Senator Brian Townsend, Representative Kim Williams, Representative Trey Pardee. Those are, those are the ones I've seen, and I apologize if there are others. What? Uh, Representative Earl Jakes I saw as well. Thank you, Margaret. So I want to thank them, and there are probably others uh, here as, as well. You know, many challenges exist in our efforts to provide all of Delaware's students with the educational opportunities that they deserve. But we should also recognize the great progress that we're making as a result of the extraordinary commitments and efforts that have been undertaken by teachers, by parents, by administrators, by other staff in our schools, and by community leaders many of whom are here tonight. You all have dedicated lives to the future of our children and to giving them the best chance to reach their potential. 
no matter their upbringing. And because of your efforts, graduation rates are at an all-time high and dropout rates are at an all-time low in Delaware. More students, particularly low-income students, are applying to and attending college. We've greatly expanded the opportunities for students to prepare for college or for a career by raising our standards. And the number of students taking AP or dual enrollment classes to gain college credit is also increasing. Working with our districts, we've launched a new program called Pathways to Prosperity, and that enables students to earn college credits and professional credentials while they're still in high school. More than 1,400 of our youngest students are participating in world language immersion programs, spending half of their school day learning in either Chinese or Spanish. And we have doubled the number of low-income children that are attending the highest quality early learning programs. All of that is to be celebrated. But despite our progress and our shared commitment to providing all of our children with a great education, we know that there is still work to do particularly for our highest need students, including those in the city of Wilmington. In schools that serve our most vulnerable children, fewer than, 40, fewer than 30% are reading and doing math at grade level, and fewer than half reach their individual growth goals each year. They begin each fall well behind their peers, they fail to meet their targets by the spring, and they fall ever further behind. By the time they graduate from high school, if they graduate at all, they're far less likely to enter or to remain in college or to get a degree. Our hearts ache for these kids because as they are slipping, they're also entering a world in which educational attainment is more important than it's ever been. And the competition for jobs is only increasing. There has never been a better time to be a person with the right skills and there's never been a worse time to be somebody with the wrong skills. And one of the reasons that we often hear for the struggle of, our, of the kids in our city schools is poverty. And it is absolutely true that poverty presents enormous, enormous challenges for many children across our state. They, fa they face barriers to learning that the rest of us can't imagine. And that's why we need to do everything in our power to lift our children and our families out of poverty and to reach these children from the beginning of their lives to counter the effects of growing up poor. And we are committed to addressing the root causes of poverty by increasing access to the best early learning programs, by investing in economic development and reducing crime and battling the, the addiction epidemic and more. But as we pursue these goals, we cannot delay improvements to the education that kids in these communities receive. And I, like, and I know that many of you, refuse to throw up our hands and say that we can't truly improve education in these schools as long as poverty exists. That's a recipe for the status quo, a recipe for fewer of our most vulnerable children to get the skills they need to escape poverty. And they, like all of our children, only get one chance at an education, and we have a responsibility to ensure that they make the most of it because we know that every child can learn. And that doesn't mean this work is easy, but there is a path to providing a bright future for all of our students. Now, many of the solutions that have been proposed center on simply spending more money. And without a doubt, funding is part of the answer. That's why we proposed investing $6 million in the six priority schools. And it's why we've asked members of the General Assembly to provide us with annual funding to support high-need schools going forward. We also know that it's impossible to prepare our children for the future with a funding system that is 75 years old. And a task force that I'm forming, along with the leaders of the House and Senate, will look at our entire education financing system including models to direct more resources to students with the greatest needs. And while I certainly agree that it costs more to educate a child in poverty than his or her middle, middle income peers, and that our overall funding system should change, more money is not the only answer. 
After all, Delaware already has one of the highest per pupil spending amounts in the country, and we're growing our education budget every year. My budget this year proposes spending more than $35 million additional on education. That includes more teachers to meet growing enrollment in our public schools, and it includes pay increases for educators. But while we spend a lot, we don't get the results that all of our students deserve. So it's crucial that we target our resources on the things that have been proven to help our students succeed. Now, in part, that means ensuring that our city schools benefit from statewide efforts to better prepare students for college or career. That includes higher standards, as well as more opportunities for students to get workplace experience and earn professional credentials and college credits. We're committed to better training and support of all of our educators and to redesigning their compensation system, to raise starting salaries, to promote teacher leadership, and to allow, to allow more of our great teachers to earn more money and to affect change across their schools while remaining in the classroom, rather than having to take administrative roles. And for our struggling schools, many of which are located in Wilmington, we must invest in the specific intensive supports that we know can help our students. Now, that's why I launched the Priority Schools Initiative last fall. We know from the results in schools in Delaware that it is possible for poor children who face seemingly insurmountable, insurmountable obstacles to learn and succeed. At Eastside Charter, more than 90% of our children are from low-income families, and they've gone from having only 15% of their fifth graders scoring proficient in reading to 66% in just three years. At Coomba, 85% of the children are low income, and proficiency levels range from 76 to 85% in math and reading. That's above the state average. We've seen tremendous progress at Howard High, at, at Booker T. Washington Elementary, and at Lewis Dual Language Elementary. All of these schools serve students. Go ahead. All of these schools st serve students, mainly from low income families. Now, the priority schools process has been difficult and controversial. And despite disagreements about the process, I am grateful to the parents, to the educators, to the administrators, and community members in Red Clay and Christina who do agree that we, we must do better. They've worked hard over the past four months to develop school plans. And because of your hard work next year, students in the Red Clay priority schools will have an extended school day and more after-school programs. They'll have access to better technology, and there will be new parent engagement opportunities and time for families to meet with teachers and get help with homework after school and on weekends. These are things that we know work and we believe will be a game changer for these students. And I'll talk more about the work in Christina in a moment, but we're working with that district to help give their students additional support next year as well. And at the suggestion of members of the Wilmington delegation in the General Assembly, our focus on high-need schools also led to my executive order, creating the Wilmington Education Advisory Group. And I'm pleased that you'll be hearing from their chair, Tony Allen. And I want to thank all the members of the advisory group, including many current and retired teachers, community leaders, parents, and concerned citizens who have volunteered countless hours to working on solutions. And this group is not just talk. They have developed a comprehensive package of thoughtful proposals to remove barriers to delivering a quality education to high-need students. The group has also made it clear that schools with high concentration of students in poverty is more than a Wilmington problem. And they've made recommendations that are relevant for improving opportunities across our state. And these proposals are not just asking for more money or scoring political points. These are serious, actionable suggestions, recognizing that inaction is not an option. And I support their calls for a new funding model, which will be considered by the education financing group that I'm forming with the General Assembly. And I support, go ahead. And I support their call and for charter schools and for all educational programs and schools in the city. And they also recommend changing school district lines in Newcastle County, particularly 
for the non-contiguous Christina School District. Having four districts covering some part of the city has taken a toll on our children and on their families. Some students are bused to school 20 miles from their homes and it's too difficult for parents and families and for the Wilmington community to engage in their schools. And 40 years, 40 years of using lines drawn by a federal judge is enough. The Wilmington Education The Wilmington Education Advisory Group report is only the latest in decades of cries for change. We should respect the wishes of city children, parents, community leaders, and their elected representatives and seize this moment of opportunity because change must not wait for another 40 years. And I am calling, I'm calling on the General Assembly to work with our districts and with the community to pass legislation this year to remove Christina from the city and to help those families become more engaged in their children's education. The, the Christina School Board has expressed support for respecting the wishes of the community they serve and is a willing partner in this effort as part of the Priority Schools process. And my administration is committed to supporting the hard work required to make this a reality. And it is my hope that a coalition of community members School leaders and legislators will allow us to bring about the progress that has eluded Wilmington for so many years. The time to act is now. Now let me close with this. I have visited virtually every school in the state, if not every school in the state. And I am constantly in inspired by educators, by administrators, by the students doing the hard work. And there is nothing like that moment when you see a child interacting with that teacher and when the child's eyes light up because it is so clear that they get it. Those are the moments that we live for. Whether those moments happen in a neighborhood school or in a charter school doesn't really matter. It's that they happen. And it's that they happen for every child in our state. And I want to conclude by thanking all of you for remaining so invested in improving opportunities for students in the most difficult circumstances. We are all responsible. This is why I'm so inspired and impressed by the turnout tonight. We are all responsible. You know, we may not always agree on how to serve them, but if we can continue to agree to make these students the priority, I know that we will succeed because we all want the same thing, a fair chance for them to make the most of their abilities and reach their potential regardless of the circumstances of their birth. Thank you for your energy, for your enthusiasm, and thank you for all the work that we are going to do together to make sure that every child in Wilmington, every child in Delaware, has the shot that they deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, before we get going, I'd like to throw out a few house rules. Uh, First, I'm going to introduce the panelists, then I'll ask a few questions, then we'll move into the interactive segment with the audience. All of you who brought smartphones will be given an opportunity to vote on questions that we're going to flash up on these screens here, and results, I'm told, are going to be displayed momentarily, soon, as soon after we vote. Uh, there are two ways for you to ask questions tonight. One, members of our team will be walking through the audience with microphones, live microphones. I would appreciate it if you identify yourself before speaking. If you don't want to do that, you can write questions on the forms that are, um, that are circulating, have circulated through the building tonight, and people on our team will uh, bring them up to me. I hope that some of them will be sorted so I don't have to sort out all the redundant questions from this perch. Uh, with that said, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get moving. Um, I want to introduce the panel first. 
To my immediate right is Tony Allen, who is the uh, chair of the Wilmington Education Advisory Board and a Bank of America executive. It was the uh, advisory committee's uh, recommendations for improving uh, achievement in the city that are the heart of many of the things we're going to discuss tonight, school boundaries, funding, and governance. Uh, a Wilmington resident, Tony, as I said, leads communications for the Bank of America's Consumer Banking Division and has served on numerous groups in the city, including the Urban League, Wilmington Hope Commission, and United Way of Delaware. He has a doctorate in urban affairs and public policy from the University of Delaware and a master's de uh, degree in public administration for Baroch, Co Baroch College. Um, he has a PhD somewhere, but I might be missing that. Tony also is the father, and uh, the, what he and his wife, Raina, are very passionate uh, about this issue. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. To Tony's right is David, uh, Senator David Sakula, who has served in the State Senate since 1990 and chaired the Senate Education Committee for 23 years. During that time, he sponsored major, major legislation on charter schools, public school accountability, and full day kindergarten. He's a graduate of Mount Pleasant High School and the University of Delaware. He taught in public schools during desegregation before moving to DuPont, where he is currently an associate investigator. David his, and his wife, Kathy, uh, David's wife is Kathy, and she's a nursing instructor at Dell Tech. They have one daughter, Megan. Welcome, David. Elizabeth Lachman is a public policy graduate student at the University of Delaware who has previously served as a public ally and a video producer. She's a mother with a child in the public school system and has been on the front lines of education reform movements, working on the committee with Tony's and other, Tony and others to make a difference. Welcome, Elizabeth. Mike Matthews is a product of Red Clay Schools and is a fifth grade teacher at Warner Elementary School, one of six institutions labeled priority schools by the state. Mike serves as president of the Red Clay Education Association, the teachers union that represents more than 1,200 educators in 30 schools in Red Clay, a number that would increase if the city schools now governed by Christina School District moves to Red Clay as recommended by the committee. Mike is a strong advocate for local, con local control of schools and a vor voracious critic of standardized testing. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Lamont Brown has been head of Eastside Charter, which the governor just cited for three years, a period praised by school administrators who note that achievement scores soared with the use of innovative, measurable teaching techniques. Brown, who has a doctorate in educational leadership from the University of Delaware, was last year named School Leader of the Year by the State Board of Education. Recently, he also assumed leadership of Family Foundations Academy uh, Charter School as well. Welcome, Lamont. <laughs> Finally, we have Merv Doherty, who has been superintendent of Red Clay School District since 2009 and was previously superintendent for academics and principal at H.B. DuPont Middle School in Hocassin. He has served on numerous state task force and last year was president of the Delaware School Chiefs Association. That's the chief of the chiefs, all the superintendents. He has a doctorate in leadership uh, in, in education from Wilmington University and a master's degree in administration and supervision from Salisbury University. And think about this. Should Christina schools now in the city boundaries move to Red Clay Merv would play a big role in welcoming, I believe, five new schools, 1,800 new kids, and more than 200 additional employees into his district. Welcome, Merv. Now, before I begin, I want to tell all the panelists that if you have something to say after I 
ask a question of one candidate, I mean, one, um, one panelist, got educate, got election on my mind. One, one panelist, uh, please let me know and I'll try to accommodate uh, your desire to speak. Tony, I'd like to start with you. It's been 60 years since the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision that ended segregation in American schools, a ruling that over decades spawned policies intended to equally address the needs of all students nationwide. You wrote in your interim report that thousands of Wilmington children still do not fully benefit from a quality public education and that now is the time to act to ensure that we strengthen schools in the city for, for decades to come. From your perspective, Tony, what actions must we take and in what order? Uh, thank you, David, for allowing uh, the Women's Education Advisory Committee to be here. I'm proud to be uh, on this panel with everybody I, I know and have worked closely with, particularly over the last seven months. Um, with respect to your question, let me start at the beginning. Um, I always start presentations of this kind uh, with Brown versus Board and remind particularly Delawareans that the lower, case, the lower court cases uh, in Brown included Delaware cases. In fact, Chancellor Seitz and Attorney Redding set the precedent for Brown versus Board of Education in Delaware. So it goes that potentially if Chancellor Seitz and Attorney Redding had not been able to figure out a way for the courts to rule in favor of the plaintiff in the lower court, there potentially is no precedent for the U.S. Supreme Court ruling. That's 1954. Yet in Delaware, there was no implementation of Brown at all till 1974. And that was not by political will or act of the General Assembly. That was by legal prescription. So there is a history of concern and conflict between what we think is right um, by citizens, whether they be teachers, educational administrators, uh, civic leaders, et cetera, and what it takes with respect to political will to get things done. As you said, David, it's been 40 years um, and we've been operating, at least de facto, under this legal prescription that causes now four traditional school districts, one Votech school district, and by the fall of 2015, 13 charter schools to serve 10,600 Wilmington City children with no unified plan. That's 18 separate governing units, not including the State Department of Education or the State Board. So our first recommendation is to streamline governance in a way that is best useful uh, for the children. Uh, we believe that Christina, as the governor said, uh, which is one of four out of 14,000 school districts in the country that is discontinuous should leave the city. We say that for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the Christina School District looks much different today than it did 40 years ago. One fact that uh, came to me uh, about a month ago as we were finalizing our interim report is that 50% 50% of all public school children in the state of Delaware qualify for free or reduced lunch. Note, I didn't say Wilmington in the state of Delaware. So Christina, operating in the western part of Newcastle County, we still believe will have significant concerns and issues to face with a diverse group of folks, racially, ethnically, and from an income perspective if they concentrate their efforts in, in western Newcastle County. I'd also say that, uh, and the governor did not mention this, but Colonial School District, where I graduated from, proud William Penn alum, uh, has about 200 Wilmington students that go to Colonial, uh, that operate in the Colonial School District, but no schools in the city, no schools. So we also, in addition to Christina, are asking that Colonial leave the city. And we believe that that has a significant import relative to creating responsive governments. One of our committee members, Nambi Chikwocha, Wilmington City Councilman, has, is a longtime student advocate. When he has to deal with issues from families who are concerned about their students, he has to talk to a lot of different governing bodies who will give him different answers about how best to advocate for their children. So this notion of streamlining governance, we, we believe, is a part of clearing the underbrush 
as it relates to streamlining uh, school district operation. The last thing I'd say is uh, on the charter schools, I told you that there are 13 uh, charter schools by the fall of 2015 that'll be operating uh, in the city. My sense, of, my sense of that, and I, I'd argue it's a limited sense, but my sense is that there is not a lot of collaboration uh, between the charter schools themselves. There's certainly some, but not a lot, not universal, and certainly almost little collaboration uh, between charters and, school, and traditional school districts. That's ha that has to change. That has to change. So we do believe that uh, Wilmington Charter Consortium, which would be operated by the charter community itself, but would be responsible for better collaborating um, between themselves and with traditional school districts is important. And the last thing I'd say, and there are many recommendations in our report, but the last thing I'd say is Wilmington needs a voice. Wilmington has very little voice with respect to how their children, our children, are being educated. Um, so we are endorsing the Office of Public Policy and Education and the Wilmington Educational Alliance that is being proposed by uh, Wilmington City Council and uh, the mayor as a, a, a two areas we think are useful. One, community mobilization, and two, parent engagement. We think that'll have significant import in addition to the regular advocacy um, they do in that work. That is the crux of sort of the first order of our recommendations, and we feel like it's important um, for us to move forward. Thank you. Okay, David, let's move on to you. You've seen a lot of education policy and funding fights during your tenure in the General Assembly, Assembly I'm sure. Break down for us the legislative bound hurdles inherent in changing school boundaries for Christina. As Tony just mentioned, one of only four school districts in the country that do not have contiguous borders and moving Christina students into red clay. I, I think uh, first I want to um, acknowledge Representative Gerald Brady is here also. He has joined us. I, I think um, one of the issues that um, we, we sometimes don't think about, but is it's really uh, evident that the, the four districts sharing part of the city uh, artificially dilutes the voice of the residents of those people uh, of, of the city of Wilmington because they, do, they, they can't have the kind of representation on a school board that they would have if they were in, in, in more of a, a unified si situation like what's proposed. Senator Henry's here. She uh, co-chaired or chaired uh, a neighborhood schools task force that had recommendations very similar to the, the one Tony Allen's group mm -hmm. had. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have an audience like this at any point. <laughs> and yet there were parents, teachers, administrators, school board members, the business community, higher education, and other stakeholders who were all represented. Good people can sit down, look at the facts, and make a good recommendation. The next step is sometimes the hard thing. Uh, and it's, it's unfortunate, but I, I, we, we didn't have that critical mass we needed at the time to make the necessary change so that, so that we could progress at that point. Uh, throughout all of the committees and commissions and task forces that I've had the honor of serving on, um, we've set some ground rules down. And one of the first, and this goes back to when I was first elected and Mike Castle was governor, uh, and, and the reform that came out of the gap analysis. One of the ground rules was a belief that all kids can learn and achieve to high standards. And another thing that, that was kind of a natural outgrowth of that was adults can make decisions that can hinder or help that. And, and you know, sometimes no decision hinders. <laughs> and I think too often in the past when there's been a committee or a commission or a task force, um, the next step hasn't had that critical mass necessary to, to, to go forward. Um, I'm honored to be up here with my colleagues. Uh, I am excited about one, the size of the group that's here, two, the people who I've had a chance to, 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 to talk to. And, and I think this might be the time to make that next step. Good. 
All right, David, I, while, while I have you, I want to I get a couple more in with you being the chair of the Education uh, Committee in the Senate. One of the other uh, notions that was discussed in the committee's work was uh, weighted funding for needy schools. Is there willingness among more wealthy schools to give up some of their funding to help less fortunate cities in the inner city? That's a great question. Um, I, I also have the honor of serving on a, uh, a study group for the National Conference of State Legislatures, and we're looking at international and national best practices. And there's a gentleman named Mark Tucker who's uh, published a lot of uh, very interesting and important information on, on how uh, students are funded. And one of his books, it's uh, Surpassing Shanghai, has a whole bunch of graphics in it and one of them is about how you, how you fund based on uh, the, the economic uh, ability of, of the student. And the United States is one of two countries that spends more on wealthy kids than on poor kids in the entire planet. And, and you know, one of the things that all of the countries who've improved significantly in academic performance over the last 30 years, one of the things they've done is they've focused on those kids who were the lowest performers at the time. And that's where they've made their greatest gains. Um, it's been said that if you disaggregate the data and you look at only schools with less than 10% poverty, they will score uh, as high on tests like the PISA as any country in the world. And that's true, but guess what? Most of the school districts in this country that have less than 10% poverty have less than 1% poverty. <laughs> that's just the way things work out. And it's a shame. Uh, so, so we have to recognize and we have to agree that kids can learn. We have to agree that adults can make those decisions. And, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things, the city can't do this alone, but every one of us will benefit if we get it right. Every one of us will. And, and that's the thing that we have to look forward to if we're gonna get it done. David, I just wanna make one clarifying point. I, I think it's important uh, for the audience to hear. Um, let's just be cautious about this simply being a city of Wilmington problem. I, I preface my comments with the fact that 50% of all public school children throughout the state qualify for free and reduced lunch. What we're proposing is either we throw out the current unit count system for uh, weighted student funding, or uh, we add three pieces to the unit count. One is funding for schools with high concentrations of poverty, students from high concentrations of poverty. Two is English language learners. And three is special education, kindergarten through the third grade. And I would tell you that uh, in e each of those cases, there are folks along the Route 9 corridor, around Route 40, in lots of places in Dover, along the western uh, part of Sussex County, that would benefit. It's not just the Wilmington problem, and I think we have to make sure that when we're, <coughs> we're talking about this, that the notion that Delaware will improve. I mean, I always say no great city, no great state. I always say that, but I do believe that there are children suffering in suburban locations as well as urban locations that need and deserve our support. Very good point, thank you. I agree completely. David, could I chime in? Yeah, please. Uh, weighted funding has been a particularly interesting topic as a, as a teacher and as a president of association that represents 30 schools, uh, some very, very affluent schools and some very, very high poverty schools. I think there are two pieces to the weighting, weighted funding that, that could come out of this. I have some teachers in my, our more affluent schools who say, does weighted funding mean that you're going to take the money from my school and I'm going to have class sizes of 50 kids since we have students that perform so well? And I would say that's not my version of what weighted funding should be. I believe weighted funding should be a system whereby we realize that there is a group of students who come to us in our highest poverty schools with such deficits that they require resources 
that are, uh, that are far beyond what our typical unit funding count provides, far beyond what the typical Title I federal funding provides. So I'd like to think that weighted funding, if we move forward with this conversation, would be the second and not the first, because I don't feel that this, the children in our more affluent schools deserve to have resources taken from them either. But uh, this is a great conversation, and I just wanted to say thank you to the United Way, Rodell, and the News Journal for hosting this. Thank you. Elizabeth, uh, as Tony mentioned, there are uh, a lot of bodies governing City of Wilmington. 18, if one includes four public school districts, 13 charters, the Votech School, and that doesn't include the State Board of Education, the feds, or the legislature. My question to you, does 18 governing bodies fragment the cohesiveness of the education in the city of six, 17 square miles, A, and then B, how does, that how does that manifest itself in the lives of students and parents trying to navigate the system to do the right thing? Okay, well, that was a pretty good setup. Thank you, David, for having me here, and I'm happy to be here with all the panelists. Um, can you hear me? Okay. So, my experience of Wilmington schools and the governance system um, goes back to, I mean, I'm, I'm also, like Mike, a product of Red Clay. Uh, I went through the Red Clay school system, <laughs> um, product of busing also, a uh, graduate of AI High School in 1997. So um, I certainly experienced uh, Wilmington under four, well, I guess five, including the Votech district myself. So, um, and wasn't as aware of the governance system through that experience as a student, but I came back into the system in 2008 as a mom, and um, I have a child that I have in a, a local school, and after she had been in school for a few years, I became the PTA president, and uh, being that her school is a high poverty, urban, traditional school, we certainly have a lot of the challenges that everyone's talking about tonight, and. Um, you know, in order to, as a parent, advocate for the best thing for your child, there's a lot of layers to go through uh, in order to, you know, sort of find that, that right person to talk to who can help route the resources that you need uh, to your kids. So I would say, essentially, we would try to reach out to our, our, our district. <laughs> Um, and go to board meetings and things like that. And that's an intimidating thing enough as a parent to do, uh, to have to do that. And what happens when you have four districts fracturing that parent voice, you have the city broken up into all these little pieces and so many, uh, that, that so many boards that need to be spoken to in order to get the resources that are needed for the kids. Um, and I think a great example is recently we had the referendum, okay? Uh, Red Clay, we were able to pass our referendum, get some more resources so that our kids can access, um, and Christina's didn't pass. So if you think about it in that sense, um, we have a very uneven routing of resources to kids across the landscape of Wilmington. So with all of the thousands of kids that we've got, they're not necessarily all receiving the same resources uh, because there's all different kinds of bo bodies making decisions about re resources that are going to reach the classroom. Um, so, I mean, I think in your setup, it's quite obvious that there are so many different groups making those decisions. So, I mean, it's a pretty clear answer. But yeah, I mean, it absolutely makes it difficult. Yes, Merv. Uh, David, if I could, um, you know, as a superintendent, <clears throat> when you have, um, for example, just four school districts, um, we have a, an issue where uh, we have to think about our children. Uh, they, our children will move quite a bit in the city. That means they have to disconnect from where they, they start school. They may have to go to another school. Uh, with so many school systems in the city, there's not a continuous opportunity of services, uh, not only for mental health, not only for services that children need, but also curriculum. And as we know, as research says, every time a child leaves and goes to another school during a school year, they fall three months behind. And so the opportunity to look at this picture in a, in a large framework here that allows a governing body to control this, to help the students. You know, we talk about the, the adults involved, but it's still about the students. 
and the students are suffering because of the transit that transi transitions that occur throughout a school year. Uh, you know, example, we picked up over 50 students just in January because they moved, just in January. You know, we pick up a lot of students every month, but it's just an issue that needs to be resolved. And uh, the only way that's going to occur is if we come together about this issue and have one governance body. Lamont? I'm going to add a slightly different take on this. Um, I do agree that governance is an important factor that we need to address. At the same time, I've never heard a kid say my district is too big. Um, the reality is if Dizzy has a question or concern to address academically, if her principal and that leadership is strong and responsive and making decisions in the best interest of their kids, despite the district, she's going to have a strong school and not feel compelled to leave to another school in January or to a charter school. So I always, as much as I love the recommendations, the one thing that I see is missing is talent. We always talk about power to the people. What about talent of the people and talent of our leaders who are making decisions? There's a lot of power that our leaders have. And I think school level autonomy, not just at the leadership level, but our teachers as well, can help improve our schools regardless of where they are so that all of our kids truly do have a great opportunity. And the governance is not the issue, um, but the leadership in the schools can be a powerful one. Good, thank you. <laughs> okay, let me move on to Mike. Um, Mike, in the stories leading up to, to tonight's forum, you said something that really caught my attention, that you didn't believe traditional public schools could learn from charter schools because the institutions are fundamentally structured differently. They're not apple-to-apple -apple comparisons. I want, I want to make sure I have this right, so please correct me if I'm wrong. The bedrock you stand on is that charters, with, with pretty stiff entrance exam requirements, Pick, cherry pick the best students with strong parental support, leaving traditional students with the tougher kids, some who have behavioral problems that thwart learning. Hence your comment in the story today about going home some evenings feeling like you didn't get a lot of teaching done that day. Is that essentially where you're coming from? Well, I would clarify those comments, and I believe when I, I spoke with Matt Albright last week, I spoke at length with him on multiple topics. Um, it was in the context of a t Senate task force that I served on last year regarding collaboration between public schools and charter schools, and I will be very frank. I served on that task force for about six months, and I am not sure what we came out with on that task force in, in measurable, shareable ideas between charters and public schools. One member of the committee said Singapore math is an example of collaboration. We have Singapore math going on in some of our red clay schools. I would not call that an example of collaboration between charters and public schools. Uh, the concern I have is that there are different rules used by charter schools and by traditional public schools. I am not against the entrance exams. I am not against the, the cherry picking, which is an offensive term to some, but I would say that that is the practice that is used by some charter schools. What I am against, and I have enumerated this many times, I am against the labeling and comparisons that are being made to our traditional public schools that are dealt, that are dealt a different hand than the charter schools. If the charter schools would like to have those entrance requirements, I'm fine with it as long as it meets you know, minimal you know, civil rights requirements and legal requirements, which they do. But all I want is the labeling of our high need schools and the threats of firing 50% of our staff and making our principals reapply for their jobs or paying principals $160,000. That's really what I was getting at at the crux of that comment. We must stop the comparisons. We are in a society right now, we are attempting to standardize our children. We can't standardize our children. Well, one of the things, let me, let me come at this a, a, a different way. One of the things that uh, your colleague sitting next to you has been cited for uh, and praised for is the um, intensive, uh, week-by-week week observation and coaching of, of teaching 
that charters are using to really good success to move yeah. move scores really move the bar and the governor just cited some of those um, numbers are, are you saying that that won't no. work in traditional no. schools no 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 actually i am I'm very interested in this. Our state association, the Delaware State Education Association, I know has been meeting with you, Dr. Brown, recently to talk about your evaluation system. And within state code, state code allows for local education uh, association, school districts, to come up with their own form of evaluation system. I am totally on board with local school districts uh, you know, looking into new ways to evaluate teachers. We do walkthroughs in the Red Clay School District where principals, administrators are in rooms regularly uh, with their iPads, taking notes. Uh, you know, the walkthroughs or the evaluations that they do at Eastside are a little more in depth than a walkthrough. I'm on board with that. However, the, the comment I think I was getting at in the paper today, I don't see that as a cure-all. And I'm, I don't think it's suggested that that's a cure-all, but I don't think that that is going to have as great of an impact in turning around our schools as, as some may suggest. Well, have you got, before I get to Lamont, what's your roadmap? What, what do we really need to do? <laughs> what, what do we need? Uh, wow, I, we need a lot. We need a lot. But the first thing that we need to do is we need to treat these very sensitive high need schools with the respect that they deserve in not labeling them and tearing them down through something like the Priority Schools Project, which is exactly what I feel it is. We need to listen to our educators in the classrooms, our educators who say we have such a, we have such a great need, we have such a great chasm of ability in these classrooms that perhaps if we got more teachers, we got more parents to lower these class sizes, if we received more wraparound supports, we have some great services at Warner Elementary. We have a school climate coordinator, Ms. Taylor Gibbs. She is wonderful. We need more Ms. TGs to go and make those home visits to connect our families with the resources they need because so many of our children come to us without. Thank you. So Lamont, when you and I talked about you participating in this discussion, you were uh, wildly optimistic about the future of education in Delaware and uh, <laughs> believing that some of the uh, approaches that were being used at your, your school and other charters would easily be exportable to uh, other uh, schools around the uh, state. Uh, what would be your roadmap for moving forward? I would say three things, um, money, manpower, and mindset. Uh, the first one is money. Um, we know that we have a certain group of students all across our state who have significant needs. Um, so the funding that we talked about needs to uh, be sensitive to those needs and provide more resources uh, for those schools. At the same time, we can put all the resources in the schools. If we don't have the right manpower um, and the right skill set at the teacher level, the leader level, the superintendent level, then that money is a waste. Yes. Um, and to hear you say earlier, that, or, or, or uh, uh, Governor Markell say that we are one of the leading states in terms of per people spending, there's a gap between the money we're spending and how we are spending it. So I think that we need to be, mm -hmm. we need to really push the manpower, not just who's in our building, but the knowledge level um, of, our, uh, of our educators but also a mindset. There are a lot of false assumptions. And the reality is, we hear a lot of times all kids can learn, but the reality is we don't all believe that. If we look at the words we use, if we look at the actions that we, um, that we make, there is a lot of evidence that there are folks in our state who truly don't believe that all kids can learn. So I think that we have to come together, put forth the right things um, for all of our kids. Um, I would push Mike a little bit. Um, it may be that an evaluation system is not the end all, but it could be a part of the solution. So come check it out. Um, <laughs> but also, when it comes to, comes to knowledge, we have to educate ourselves. There are a lot of people, whether it's reporters, politicians, parents, uh, government leaders, et cetera, et cetera, who say things that sometimes are just inaccurate. So when I hear things like charters do this, we are telling the public that all charters do this, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying maybe it's these three or four. Um, so it may seem offensive, the word cherry picking. To some extent, it's hard to hear all charters when I know some charters who don't do those things at all. 
I know some charters that have the same exact population um, of kids, and yet we address every single issue. We know poverty, we know special education, we know lack of funding for early education, yet we fight through and do what we can. So I know that from a mindset standpoint, which is the third point, we, we acknowledge the issues and then we say it is our responsibility to fight through them and do what we can and not make excuses and not um, let that be. I heard Jeffrey Canada uh, speak last week and he ended his conversation by saying, don't blame me. We need to stop saying don't blame me and take accountability for what we can do despite whatever restraints that we have. Hey, David. I, I, would, I would like to follow up on that real quick because I have some concerns with the philosophy of Jeffrey Canada. When you look at the statistics from his schools, uh, there is a very, very high attrition rate from kindergarten down through eighth grade. Um, I, I have concerns that in kindergarten through second grade, we do not have a measurable, a standardized measurable assessment like DCAS or SBAC. In Jeffrey Canada's schools, you see a, a lowering of the number of students as they filter through his system. So I think that's a concern with some charter schools where we're seeing high attrition rates as the children filter through the system. So I, I think there are, there are issues there with those numbers that, that could have a, a drastic impact on either the success or failure rates of those schools. And I would just say, <laughs> I agree with some of that. The difference is, we don't hear a lot of charter people saying all districts are such and such. Right. But when we have a charter da data, we say all charters. And I think that it's irresponsible Fair to enough. our public to state that. So, David, can I chime in just a second? So, uh, first of all, it's, I see that Senator Coons just arrived. Senator, thank you for being here. <laughs> I, and, and he and I have had some discussions about this issue. Look. The charter law was established in 1995, right? I think at the time, I'm not sure what people thought charter was going to become. You'll find in our report that we project that there'll be a 90% increase in charter seats in the city of Wilmington in the next five years. This notion that we should, that charters are going away is a false notion. It's more likely that there will be more charter seats and in effect more Wilmington students in those seats than there are in traditional schools in the next five years. So here's what we're proposing. The National Association of Charter Authorizers suggests that every authorizer, every charter authorizer, have a plan, a strategic plan. And that plan consider the net optimal benefit of charters, where they, how they interact and work with traditional schools, what those charters do, and how we might move forward in a coordinated fashion. 1995, state didn't have a plan. The turn of the 21st century, state doesn't have a plan. Today, state doesn't have a plan. And I might argue if you do a charter statewide plan, that is actually like doing a large, comprehensive public education plan. Because you can't do this moving forward by having this us, them mentality. And the other thing I'd say is, and I think Dr. Brown's right, all charters aren't created, aren't created equal. You're not going to walk in Wilmington Charter and think you're an east side charter, believe me. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um. But, by the, but by, the, by, by the same token, charters, it, in my view, and as I understand it, were, the charter law was created such that you could find best practices. They would be free of all of the other restrictions of traditional schools. And as you found those best practices, they would scale up. And they wouldn't just scale up in the charter community. They'd scale up in the traditional system. But the two don't talk to one another. The two don't talk to one another, and, and, not, and neither, neither one is going away. So we have to. We have to develop a systemic statewide plan that I think would have optimal benefit generally across Delaware, and particularly in Wilmington. Thank you. Can, can I speak to that a little bit? Can, as a parent, just to sort of follow up on that? I mean, I think um, a lot of what's being said speaks to the concern that parents have about the inconsistency of schools in the city. Um, and it's not just the addition of charters that did it. I mean, I graduated in 97 and came back with a child in 2008, and the system was vastly changed in Wilmington from what I had left, and it was charters, and it was choice, and it was the Neighborhood Schools Act. Um, and what we were left with was a system of schools with 
caste gaps and isolated poverty um, and, and students that were isolated and just really a lot of chaos and hysteria for parents to deal with in trying to figure out how to navigate this new landscape of Wilmington and the county at large, which I think, um, I would hope that a comprehensive plan statewide potentially would add some stability because I think um, as a parent we're really looking for a stable landscape of schools so whether charters your thing or whether traditional schools are your thing that you have all positive options out there to make um, and and I just think that looking back at some of those policies that happened during that gap I, I hope that we can be reflective of some of the things where we might have gone off the rails a little bit in creating a stable landscape of schools for kids um, so that as we go forward, maybe we can pay attention to things like equity and, and things like that as we go forward. Okay. Yes. okay. All right, Merv, we're gonna move on to you. And this is a question from an audience member, which is essentially the same question that I was about to ask you. If all of the priority schools, and actually there's a couple more to be included, if, you, if all of them move from priority and everything from Christina come to Red Clay, how quickly would such an action, how long would it take for such an action to occur? How much would it cost? Would all stakeholders be involved in its implementation? Really, thanks for that question. <laughs> yeah, all right. <clears throat> well, we haven't been notified that the schools are coming to Red Clay, first of all. We've not been in any discussion with Department of Education or with Really? Christina. I thought Tony just told you about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. Um, you know, the, uh, the issue comes to the point of if you're just talking to three schools or you're talking about the Christina District, there has to be some time for planning, for uh, school boards to discuss the issues, for um, governance to occur. I mean, you're looking at, right now we're talking at the 10,000 foot level. And I think everyone is excited about a path forward. But the, the stakeholders have, have not been involved in the discussion. Um, if you're gonna say, here, we're gonna give you three schools, um, you're probably talking, you know, at least two years for this discussion to really formulate out. There are a lot of people who are interested in this. You do not want to uh, ostracize people who have a buy into this plan. The one thing that we, we, we have to remember is that the partnerships for these schools are extremely important with city government, with city partners, with um, programs, a lot of the programs that were here tonight that were had tables up, want to support the students. And so when you're looking at this effort of time uh, is one thing, but then funding, I mean, I think that's a, a, an issue that's going to take a long time to figure out because one, will there be changes in the funding formula, which we already have a formula, will it be adapted to help students in need because as Tony and other people have said, this funding change will help every Delawarean, not just the city. And so the opportunity to look at how this is going to occur will take the opportunity of school boards to discuss, have discussions for legislators to pass whatever uh, laws have to occur, but also for, uh, you're just not stopping at the priority school issue, you're looking at the possible task force uh, from the Wilmington Educational Advisory Committee to be implemented as well. And uh, I think the, uh, the eight recommendations that were in the, rec in the plan uh, have to be addressed. It's easy to say, let's turn them over, but the, 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 uh, the detail is extremely important in how this occurs because for some experience with, in, our, in our district, when everybody is at the table, the lift is a lot easier. And to think that Red Clay can do this alone is not the case, is that we are gonna to have to have strong support, uh, strong uh, legislative support, strong school board support, strong parent support, and I think that changes the climate. Okay, uh, David. I just wanted to, to follow up and say, you know, this is really an opportunity to engage. You know, you're, you're using uh, a report as kind of the template in a district, but you really do have to get all the stakeholders, as, as Merv said, and, and the, the best chance of this working is if you go through a process and you have that group, that district saying, you know what, we're gonna make this work. We can make it work and we're gonna make it work and we're gonna have the, 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 the resources we need to get it done. That's, that's something that unfortunately didn't happen with 
the priority schools. That's something that didn't happen with other things that we're, we, we have attempted to do in the past. But here's an opportunity, and that's why we have to keep as many of you involved in this as possible if we're going to get it done. Well, speaking of priority schools, I wanted to uh, I wanted to follow up with one more. I believe we're about ready to try this digital voting uh, here in a moment. Uh, let me ask um, let me ask Tony a question that comes from an audience member, uh, and they felt like the uh, priority school initiative was disruptive, uh, and they want to know. How did that help students? You're asking me. I'm asking you. What do you think? <laughs> or maybe I should. Well, yeah, I mean, do you, I mean, from your perspective, yeah. from doing all this work, because you guys really got started in earnest in September or so, I believe, and you've looked at this, you've talked to a lot of parents, a lot of administrators. Looking back on it, was, was that initiative really helpful in the discussion that Mike was talking about a minute ago on reapplying for his here's, job? Here's how that? I would respond. There, in the last seven months, there have been a confluence of events that some of which have been inartful, some of which have been centered around conflict. So think about the priority school's announcement, the mayor suing uh, the state to keep more open, REACH uh, suing the state to do a similar thing, the ACLU um, claim again, against uh, charter schools claiming uh, resegregation with the U.S. Office of Civil Rights. That, that has created a confluence of events, all of which, by the way, have happened in the last seven months that I believe have allowed an opportunity uh, for the Wilmington Education Advisory Committee to open up a small window and develop a path forward where everybody uh, can get on the same page about how we improve Wilmington schools. With respect to priority schools, we stayed out of that for a fair amount of time intentionally. Uh, so we wanted to think about what we could all agree on, uh, what the big, big areas of, of focus were for us. And before uh, Governor made his decision with respect to priority schools, we asked him to wait and have the benefit of our interim recommendations, uh, which he did. So while I'm not sure I have a specific view on how, it been, how priority schools benefited um, students, because I'd, I'd argue it's too early to tell if anything has been helpful in that regard, I do believe that all of these events have suggested that our community is tired of 60 years of inertia. And there is now an opportunity that we need to really fight on. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to try to throw the questions up on the screens. And if you have a smartphone, you should be able to go to the URL that's going to be thrown up here, is what I'm told, and, uh, and vote. And while that's happening, maybe. Um, we can have people with the live mics begin moving through the audience, and if people want to uh, uh, have a question that they want to ask, we'll try to recognize you, and you can stand up and state your name, and uh, we, will, we will get to you. Um, okay, here's the first live poll. Does everybody, everybody go to that? DelawareOnline.com slash survey. And if anybody has uh, written questions that they'd like to be picked up, raise your hand and we will try to get those as well. Do you support removing the Christina and Colonial School Districts from the City of Wilmington so that only two districts are serving city kids? That's the first question. I believe if you say if your cell phone, if you got your cell phone there, you can vote yes or no. Can the panel vote? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, while people were trying to do that, um, do we have a live mic? Yes, we have someone in the back. Please state your name. Uh, my name is Suzanne Burnett, and um, I'm a former um, a parent who has uh, children who have graduated from the Christina School District and is doing quite well. Can I hold this? Um, thank you. And um, it was during the time, I can't believe it was 40 years ago, because my oldest child is 40, 
And um, she, uh, we were, as a, a parents, we were very concerned during this desegregation time, during the busing. Um, we lived in Newark, and um, we were concerned that my daughter, my children, had to spend three years in Wilmington. But I want you to know, those three years in Wilmington was the best time of my children's lives. They are now very productive children. Um, I think the experience of being to see that it's not just where she lives, that there's all kinds of people. And I think we're talking about moving lines and, and, uh, and making sure that the, the Wilmington stays as Wilmington, but we all need to come together. Um, and I don't think that's the answer. The answer is, where is the Department of Transportation? Where is the Department of Labor? Where is the Department of Housing? Because these are the issues. It's not just education. It is the holistic approach of dealing with families, is dealing with the community. I don't see them here. I don't think moving lines is going to create or help what we need to do in the city of Wilmington. That sounded more like a statement than a question. Oh. So uh, let's go over here. Chandra Pitts, Executive Director of One Village Alliance. I appreciate um, being here in this excellent forum. I have a question. Um, Dr. Lamont, you have an, an ex we have an excellent model right here in Delaware, among, among many um, here and around the country. You talked about money, manpower, and mindset. I know people get very sensitive when we talk about teachers. Mike, thank you for shouting out my son's elementary school teacher, Miss TG. She's awesome. We have excellent teachers. We have well-meaning individuals coming into these schools. Money, it's a, we're having a very high, high-level conversation. When we get down into the grassroots level, manpower and mindset, do you feel like the teachers are prepared for what they're walking into in these classrooms in Wilmington, Delaware, and around the state, in not only low-income low communities, but, but schools statewide, if you don't think that these teachers are prepared, how do we go about seeking the best manpower for these schools and creating the mindset that prepares well-meaning educators to come in and be highly effective at the grassroots level instead of getting totally disenfranchised? Awesome, great question. That's a, that's a great question. I appreciate you using my lingo, that means you listen, thank you. Um, my answer to that is no, I don't think uh, folks are prepared. I have never met a first year teacher who said I had a great first year. I've never met that. They always say, my first year was, was, was rough, and I'm, I'm glad I have it now. So I think we definitely, I answer that in two ways. And one is what we can do right now, and one is what takes some time. Uh, our teachers are not fully prepared, particularly to work in urban communities. And that is why the idea of diversity is so crucial to me. There are folks who grow up in one type of environment, go to college in one type of environment. They may graduate with all the skills and knowledge in the world, and then they're teaching in an environment they're not comfortable with. And I don't think it's their fault. So from a preparation standpoint, we can definitely do more. But from a mindset standpoint, um, I heard a lot of the concerns and complaints about the um, DOE's priority plan was that teachers had to reapply. The reality is if any of us was asked to take over a school or any organization, the first thing we're going to want to know is how strong is the talent pool. And if there needs to be changes to be made, we're going to want to be able to have that. Um, I think that teachers should be protected from bad leadership, but I think that great teachers should be able to be there. We need to trust our leaders to make those decisions and make sure that the folks who are in our buildings who are on the front line, because again, our kids don't care about funding. Our kids don't care about how big your board is or how big your district is. They care about, and they go home and say, Ms. Jones was great today. I had a great time in Dr. Thompson's room. And we have to do a better job of making sure every single educator at the teacher and leader level is not only prepared, but has a passion for the group of kids they are working with. And lastly, I'll say, um, I have the unique experience of working in a charter school and a district school as a teacher and a principal. I've worked in schools 
where I've heard teachers say, I wish this school was the way it was 10 years ago. We know what they mean by that. Those are the teachers right now who, frankly, a lot of us are protecting. We have to make sure that the people who are in our classrooms, who are dealing with our kids, who are trusting our kids, when they spend more time with them than their parents do, are the ones who are not only prepared, but genuinely sensitive to their needs um, and doing everything that's in their best interest at all times. And I, I'm, I, that is, yeah. I'm gonna piggyback off of what Dr. Brown is saying, and I wanna thank Ms. Pitts for the question because this is a really important question and it's something we're going through in red clay right now. Uh, we, we have a host of very experienced teachers in our three priority schools who are well-versed with the community they're working with. And because of what many of the, the teachers in these three buildings perceive as very heavy-handed tactics by the Department of Education and by this administration, I, as a president of their association, am very concerned that because so many of these teachers feel worn down by how, they've been how their schools have been treated in the press, that they're not going to want to remain at the school, not because they don't love the school, love the kids, but because they feel like they've been disrespected and their students, their schools have been disrespected. And the concern that I have to Ms. Pitts's point is if those teachers leave, many of these teachers are 10, 15, 20 year teachers who are committed to these communities, who go visit families on weekends and before the school year starts, we will get many first year teachers through, through certain programs, it, it could be fresh out of college or Teach for America, whatever it may be, who are not prepared to come into these severely high need schools and they will do their two or three years and they will leave and this is not the type, uh, these are not the type of teachers we need in these schools. We need two teachers who are committed, who are committed to the community and who are going to stay in these schools to work with these children and these families who need them. That was a great question. Okay, we, we have a news break. The uh, overwhelming support that you might have noticed for moving, uh, the support of moving Christina schools into red clay. 85%, uh, I believe, or something like that. Uh, as we go on to the next question, I wanna, the folks out there with the microphones, who's got, Chris, do you have, you have somebody back here? Uh, thank you. My name is Stephen Fackenthal, uh, teacher at Richardson Park Elementary. Uh, currently at my school, we have one behavior interventionist, one psychologist, both of which are half time. How do we expect our kids to uh, to meet the demands of high stakes testing when we have when we struggle to meet the needs of their emotional, social, and behavioral uh, needs? How do we expect them to meet that because it's very challenging? So who wants to take that one, Merv? What do you think? It just so happens he's in my school district, so sure, I'd love to take that one. You know, it, it, and it comes down to, um, you know, I'm very proud that um, we cash no excellence units in. We, everything we get, we try to put in other schools. And this is a point of how, how, many, uh, how many people do we have? How much can we afford? And this is the issue of the funding uh, formula. And I agree with Stephen. Uh, we would love to put more people in our schools because I believe the uh, the social workers, the mental health workers are extremely important because if you haven't been in our schools, you know, you'll see people working very hard every day in the classroom. But when we when we have a social worker or a, a mental health worker, they, they work with the student and the family. And this is the issue that we have to tackle. We have to realize that our children are coming from situations where not only does the child need assistance, but the the home needs assistance as well. And uh, it's a very important issue for us because when you're dealing with poverty, dealing with high need schools, remember, we try to keep them as long as possible. We have opportunities where we're even serving dinner in some of our schools because we try to keep the students as long as possible. But they're still going home and there's still issues there. And then they come back the next day and they're, they're struggling. And so I'm hoping that as we continue to press this point of, of, of high needs funding, for our schools, that this is reconciled in well, a way somebody, that will give them can more Can somebody uh, on the panel speak to one of the yeah, series of stories we had in January, in, or late December, was on these, these people that work in the schools who, who actually wash the clothes of children. Yeah. So that's, so that's in that your district, right? right. Can, you, can you speak to that whole idea? 
uh, about, well, about what what well, what well, all I mean, schools you have to, are but doing. People who have not been in the schools and they don't really understand it. That you know, we we provide our breakfast, lunch, and sometimes dinner. We provide meals on the weekend. We provide clothing. We provide coats. Probably gave a thousand coats out this year. But you know, when our children walk into a school and the teachers see that they were in the same clothes as the day before, we have uh, clothing banks in our schools where they can help these students because it's an extremely important issue that has to occur. That I asked, I asked a, a staff, the staff one time, how many of you are going to go home tonight and not have electricity? How many are you, are you going to not eat dinner? How many are you going home tonight and not take a bath? And how many are you going to wear the same clothes tomorrow? And if we don't think that that's not a reality, it is. And we have to look at these outliers that affect our children every day. You know, when we did the vision to learn, we, we uh, it was 400 pairs of glasses of students who couldn't see. Uh, and, and thankful to Senator Coons and some other people in the state, you know, we were able to test these students. And in, in, in our nine Title I elementary schools, over 400 students now have glasses that they can see. You know, these are the things that are the wins for us that help our kids excel into education. And okay. if I can speak a little bit to what happens with that, our, our schools in Wilmington, I think, do a fine job of providing for you know mental health and, and to some extent. Um, but what that represents also, because of the way the current funding formula works, is a trade-off. I mean, having had a child in the schools, you can get a psychologist, you can get some of these other things. But what that means when you have to use resources to get those things, you can't have full-time specialists doing all the things that parents really want to see in the schools, music and art and all of those kinds of things, um, having smaller class sizes. Um, so you make the schools less viable and, and residents begin to disinvest in those schools from all backgrounds. So I think that's the whole rationale behind waiting student funding to me as a parent, is that you want to make sure that all students are able to have their needs met without losing those things that you would expect universally every school to be able to offer their children. Thank you. I understand Representative Carney's in the back of the room. Thank you for coming, John. Let's move to this question down in the front. Uh, my name is Vicki Seifert. I'm a proud 35-year educator at a very passionate faculty who loves to work at H.P. DuPont Middle School in the Rec Lake District. And my question is, one of the biggest issues, and I just want to back up a little bit. I've worked in charter, private, and public schools, so I get the whole gamut. And one of the advantages I had at charter schools was the fact that those kids stayed. They were there. They were there all the time. They came to the next year. And then when I worked at the old, those of you who know Conrad as the RAD, I registered 187 new students from January until before DST testing in, I'd say, 2000 and about three or four. That transition was beyond hurtful. At H.B. DuPont Middle School, and this is what concerns me, we have a population that is poverty, but we're not a high poverty school. My students get on the bus at 6.15 in the morning. You heard me, 6.15 in the morning. Can you imagine what today was like with the hour change? So with that being said, my biggest issue is attendance, and that's something that we really haven't addressed. Yeah. What are we going to do about those kids who don't come to school? I can't help them and I can't teach them if they're not there, and on top of the fact, if they are there, They've been on a bus ride for 40, 45 minutes or longer, and they're exhausted. We have to do something different with those children, especially in these uh, yeah. populations that we're dealing with. Well, Merv, that sounds like another one for you. I yeah, uh, it happens to be in my school district as well. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All those in red clay, please stand. It may be easier. Just <laughs> we can have our own meeting. Um, well, it is a fact that uh, you know we. Um, in our, our four traditional, um, we have actually have, have seven middle schools, but in our four traditional, we uh, divide up parts of the area of the city where our students will bus out. I mean, we really pull from the Hilltop area, uh, uh, 4th Street area. When I was principal there, it was the same thing. And our, the buses do come directly from the city out, but they do get on the bus early. And it is always, and it's, an, it's an issue. It's always going to be an issue until we look at this and say, can we provide additional assistance closer to their home? I mean, um, all four of our middle schools from Skyline to AI Middle. So you do have a great point there about attendance. And attendance is always going to be an issue because here's a good example. It's with her parents as well. Uh, yeah. Merv misses the bus going to HB. He's not getting to school now. And so that's the big problem. And so this issue of our students being bused, you know, maybe it's only 10 miles or 8 miles, but it's I can't get there. And, and I know they did do it now, and I did it when I was principal. I would get in the car and go get, go get them if they called. And so this is an issue that is 
not only red clays, but in Newcastle County, I believe. Right. We have another question. I'm going to go way back in the over here on the right. I can hardly see, but Hi. somebody. Uh, my name is Erin Chioma. I'm a proud parent, a teacher, and an administrator. And uh, my question is, I understand that parent participation is an indicator of achievement, um, even before the socioeconomic demographics. And some schools are, some models pay parents to participate, and they've shown um, wide growth margins. So are there any initiatives to motivate, encourage, and even perhaps force parents to participate? Force. Who wants, to, who wants to take that one? I'll, I'll take a, a real, the, the former lieutenant governor had an award for parent involvement and the actively engaged districts to try to come up with programs and recognized uh, parent involvement, uh, but, but it, was, it was more of a, a ceremony at the end of the year that you know, this group did this and they improved attendance or they improved, uh, you know, any number of, of different uh, features that they were looking for. Uh, but that's a great question, and we don't have a lieutenant governor now. <laughs> so, well, so maybe he'll keep it going as, a, as an attorney general. Well, also, I mean, it, if I can speak to it too as a parent, I mean, I think it's gonna be a process at this point. I mean, I think we've gotten to a point where a lot of parents are disengaged, um, sometimes for very valid reasons, either there are things that are going on in their personal lives or just a sense that they're not being responded to at the school level, at the district level, um, whatever. Um, so I think, I mean, I think some of it might speak to teacher training, administrator training, creating an, an engaging and welcoming environment that all parents from all kinds of backgrounds feel comfortable in the school and begin to feel more invested and able to participate in that way. Um, and I know there's also in our in our report a recommendation for Wilmington, part of Wilmington's voice, to be focused on doing that mobilization and helping get people what they need to be able to engage with schools in that level. So that's one practical solution, uh, potentially through city governance to be able to do those things, but we're, we didn't prescribe any specific practices. Okay, another news break. There's overwhelming support among the people in this room for shifting funding to high, pro you know, to schools struggling uh, in high poverty areas here, so interesting. I also want to recognize uh, that County Executive Tom Gordon has joined us. Uh, thank you, Tom, for coming. Uh, we have a microphone there? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so I have two questions. One is, when I read the per pupil funding, um, am I to, is the school in Wilmington and the school in Newark, when I read the per pupil school funding on the school profiles, is that the same? No. no? In a district. No, within a district. So if I was in Christina School District and the per pupil funding for um, Bancroft, is that the same exact per pupil funding for yes. Keene Elementary? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure there, I There's that. a whole lot of nuances <laughs> around school funding. Right. And for instance, the, the formula that goes to a district, then the, 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 the individual building may qualify for a certain number of yeah. what we call units. But then beyond that, um, a teacher with a master's degree makes more money than a teacher who's a first year teacher. So if you really dig down into the details and you find, uh, you know, there's, there's actually a lot, a lot more discrepancies than people think there are on the surface. And so, so that's, that's kind of um, a real important question that it just boggles you to, to try to really dig into it because there are just so many examples yeah. of how the funding uh, can be impacted by choices teachers make. And teachers are allowed uh, it to, if, if somebody retires, the people with the most seniority who want to move into that position, you know, they have first shot. And, and so you can have um, unintended consequences uh, around what happens. And so that's why the district may have some choices to make to try to supplement in a school that has more uh, first to fifth year teachers, for instance, and, and fewer master's degree teachers and fewer national board teachers, uh, and, and to try to, to supplement the, uh, the capability within that and skills within that school. My next question is, I haven't seen anywhere in the report, what is the plan to deal with the student outcomes, like the student academic performance, particularly while we're doing this planning, with the students that are already behind? 
Yeah. Who, wants to, who wants to take that one? Well, I can, I can outcomes, that's a, that's a hot topic of mine, but I do just have to respectfully correct something that the senator said. In, in our contract, seniority is not the if, if openings become available at certain schools, uh, seniority is not the first uh, choice. Principals still have to interview all candidates for those positions in, in our contract, and I'm sure it's other contracts. Seniority is actually third or fourth on the list. Principals still have ultimate say in, in how they fill those positions according to our contract. But according to outcomes, I, you know, I think this is where we need to get innovative. Is, is the, the K-12 to system as we currently see it appropriate? Whereas we, I, I, t teachers, you know, we are working with students who may not be up to grade level, who may not be passing those standardized tests, though I certainly question the validity and reliability of those standardized tests. Um, do, do, we need to, do we need to rethink what we're doing here and recast our K-12 system and go to more ability grouping. Now there's some concerns there with uh, children won't be exposed to children from different backgrounds and ability levels, so that's harmful as well. I think this is just part of the larger conversation that we need to have, not necessarily as a result of Priority Schools or the Wilmington Education Advisory Committee, but I, I think it's just philosophical as to how we run our education system, and whereas we certainly need to be focused on outcomes, uh, we need to be more concerned with the children and the inputs that are coming into our system and, and not bowing down to that, that standardized test score that has changed three times in the last five years. So okay, could, Lamont, jump in. So, so I guess the, uh, the, the drum that I, that I go back to a lot is about um, building level autonomy and leadership. So you asked about outcomes, whether it's a kid who's now able to read and wasn't before, a kid who is now behaving, better than he was before. And what I hear a lot, and, and the comments that I read and, and the concerns that I, that I hear are about the system, the K-12 system or DOE. But a lot of the things that we're talking about can be done at the school level. Yes. So when you talk about ability grouping, mm -hmm. why can't that happen? Um, I had folks, um, we, we do community meetings uh, every couple of weeks where we invite folks from the community. We had the ACLU and some folks from the mayor's office at Eastside. And we were talking about some of the things the East Side has done. And she said, well, right, you're different. District schools can't do that. And I said, well, why not? Why can't our principals at all types of schools, regardless of where they are or what type they are, um, have the autonomy um, to do what's best for that group? Why can't that principal work with their teachers mm -hmm. to implement a program, whether it's innovative or not, that works for that group? So again, I know that what I push is we know the factors that make it challenging, but we don't make those excuses, and we do what we can do in the, in the building. And we have models in third grade, for example. Most schools are self-contained. Our third grade teacher came to me two years ago and said, hey, I'm really good at math. What if I just taught math to all the third graders? Yep. And now we've done that for three years mm -hmm. now. That was a teacher-driven decision. So I think a lot of the innovative things that we talk about, a lot of reasons that we say we can't do them are actually possible. Yeah if we just have the will to do them in our buildings. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Dr. Brown. I would just say this notion of scaling up and then collaborating and coordinating across the systems, that, that can't be overstated. I mean, you could have great practices in one school, but exporting those practices in, in other schools has been largely intractable. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there are 18 different governing units in those schools. So I, I just don't want us to discount the notion that there can be things done relative to accountability that lead to scale in specific schools. And, and also, I mean, I think when we say outcomes now, we all think of test results and very specific test results. But from what I've heard in conversations that I've had, I mean, it could mean something quite different in the coming years and take a lot of other factors into account. I mean, my daughter attended a school that was certainly, is a priority school now, and um, test scores on average were rather low and, and was very labeled by that. But there were a lot of great things that were happening in that building that, that were not reflected in the outcomes that were made public. So I, I mean, I would hope to see, and I think there's a lot of discussion happening for, for those outcomes to be better reflected in, in what we call outcomes. In the okay, I want to try to get in a few more questions. I'm going to go back here, then over here. Go. Hello, my name is Arian Harley, and I have the privilege of serving as the Director of Music and Operations at the Cathedral Choir School of Delaware. Um, one thing that has 
really spoken to me are the statistics that we've been talking about. And one statistic for you is 100% of our students graduate from high school. Now, why that is really interesting to me is why is it that after school programs and other programs throughout the community do not receive funding and are not even invited many times to this table uh, to, to, to discuss the problems that are going on in the educational system when so many places like the uh, YMCA, the choir school, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, they all have wonderful track records of being able to make a difference um, in a child's education. Where are they in this conversation? Why is it that when we send emails to school districts that we don't get responses? Why is it that when we send emails to corporations, we get blown off? When we also have a voice and we have much to contribute because I spend five hours a day with with students outside of school. Yeah. And that is a significant amount of time. Almost 40,000 hours every year. And yet, we can't reach all the students who need our help because we aren't even at the table for a conversation. So how can we come to the table to have a discussion how can we serve on these committees? How can we receive funding? How can we be kept in the loop of all these different things that are going on? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Mur. Thank you. Funding. Well, uh, well uh, thanks for the question. You know, we have a great partnership with the YMCA. I was just sharing with Lamont today about something that for his school to do. Um, but we have a partnership with Boys and Girls Club. By, by the way, that's collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we actually talk a great deal, so that's interesting. Um, uh, you know, we, we have a partnership with LACC and with Hilltop and with West End. And, and we talk a great deal because these these are great partners to have because they, they work with our children before school and after school. And to tell you the truth, it would, be very, it would be very difficult to work with some of the kids without their partnerships. And any superintendent will tell you, uh, we get calls every day from people who want to help us. And if we think it's beneficial for our kids and our kids really want to thrive after it and jump into it, we try to support it. And so we tell any, and I get a lot of calls from a lot of people uh, who want to be part of our students and help us. And it's a way to find a funding or will, is it beneficial? So anybody can ever call a school system and ask the information about the after school programs. You know, I, just, I, I think this is a time for me to publicly thank everyone here, all the exhibitors to give a shout out to them because as, um, <laughs> as um, Don Baker, who is the executive director of FAME, pointed out uh, when I talked with him last week is that all learning does not occur in schoolhouses and that it takes a community to make a difference. And I think that was an excellent point. It seems to be what Lamont and both Murr, but probably everybody on this panel was saying. Tell me. I was just going to add, and I know that Michelle Taylor from the United Way is trying to coordinate um, a, a host of nonprofit organizations that are interested in engaging um, in educational outcomes because, because it, it is a little bit ad hoc at the moment. Um, you sort of catch the partnership as it comes, but if there is a more coordinated effort, and I know Michelle has one underway, I think we're going to get the kind of partnerships that the young man was talking about. And, and while we're on that topic, everyone has a uh, call to action card at the table that the United Way prepared. We'd like you all to look at those and, uh, and uh, uh, make an effort to fill them out, please. I want to go over here to the other question. Hi. Um, my question is in regards to the DOE and standardized testing. You guys can make all the changes you want, but when you have a department that's telling you that all children must close proficiency gaps, do you believe that that's something that can actually happen? Because children aren't a group, they are individuals. Some are special needs, some come from poverty. Research has shown that crime in areas do have an impact on brain function. So, how can you possibly close proficiency gaps to improve education? Why aren't we going back to summative tests and formative tests to judge how our children are rated and how our teachers are rated? Well, I would, I, I love this question and thank you for asking it. And it's nice that we have Senator Coons in the audience because I'm hoping that Senator Coons is going to go be our advocate in Washington as the, the, the 
waiver for ESCA, a reapplication of ESCA comes up again. One of the challenges that we have, that's the Elementary Secondary Education Act, which is now known as No Child Left Behind, is that there is this goal that 100% of children need to be reading on or above grade level by 2014. Well, 2014 has passed. So many states are operating under this waiver whereby if students don't meet appropriate proficiency or growth, their schools are then labeled priority schools and they have to undergo transformation or turnaround models. These are damaging to our schools. So, sir, to your question, why do we not put more faith into our educators and communities, and why do we continue to bow down to this single standardized test score? I think that's a very good question, and I'm hopeful that our delegation in Washington will represent us appropriately in reining in the abuses of the ESCA and No Child Left Behind, and it's why I recommend that any parent use their parental rights and opt out of this assessment as a means of protesting this really draconian, uh, this really draconian abuse of our education system by our policymakers. Lamont. I'm not going to argue if a test is good or not, but we know that black and brown low-income children are not going to college and graduating at the levels that other folks are. So we have to do something. And I believe in accountability. I believe that if we do certain things, we will get better. Um, Eastside, five years ago, was arguably labeled worse than a priority school. And it was this close to being shut down. So when I look at the kids in our community and I see great potential in them where I feel like not everyone does, and I see data that does not show that they are doing what they can be doing, I'm okay with measuring them as long as we're also putting forth every ounce of support for our yes. teachers, our families, et cetera, to make sure they are uh, yes. progressing. Um, we have not hit 100% proficiency, and I don't know if we ever will, but we are way better over the last four years because we educate our kids, we track their progress using formative and summative assessments, and they've gotten better. So regardless of what measure you want to use, the reality is um, if we are truly pushing, if we're holding ourselves accountable to outcomes, and it's not just student achievement, it's not just academics. But I have one data point that says a lot, and we have the same, similar demographics. 100% of our kids are minority, 88% are low income, 23% are special ed, and I would guess about 45% have some um, level of toxic stress or emotional or mental health challenge. Yet every time we have report for our conferences, we've had 92% over the last four years of our parents attend. So the efforts of our teachers to reach out, the level to which they're held accountable to making um, those, uh, that outreach. We have a partnership um, with many organizations, one of the communities and schools, where we have extra counselors in our building. Um, there are things that we can do. And again, what I'd rather us do is work together. People talk about the Delaware Way. It's the only place where we can be this tight, but yet this fragmented. We have to come together and stop blaming Stop making excuses and do something that's going to improve for our kids because every day is improving. Yeah, so let, let me just say, Dr. Brown has gotten a lot of applause tonight, but when I talk about Eastside Charter, most people call it an anomaly. Oh, they're, you know, Tony, that can't really be scaled. They're not doing, they're every, East uh, Kumba, same thing, that's, that's an anomaly. If you really believe, and believe me, I've been over to Eastside, he's doing, stuff that has nothing to do with pixie dust. That is hard work. Yeah. It is hard work what he's doing. If you really believe that we can scale across schools that have high concentrations of students from poverty, then you, we have to change this notion that it only happens in a few places. You have to change that notion. So while I hear everybody applauding, I also want to challenge you around this notion of holding high expectations for low-income students from traumatic situations. All right, we're getting close to the end. We have, Chris has one here, over here. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Taylor Jones, and I'm a recent graduate from the Colonial School District, and I'm currently attending Duke University. And one thing I feel like that's being omitted in this conversation is um, the high-achieving students within the public school systems. 
Um, Delaware, if you didn't know, has the highest density of private schools within the nation. Um, and because of that, many of our public schools are aiming to have AP and IB programs, but many of the top achieving students are not even in our public school systems. They are constantly being pulled by private and charter schools. And I wanted to know what ways um, is the public school system going to foster these high achieving students? How are you planning to retain them? Um, because in regards to the entire public school system, when you have high achieving students, not only does it raise public image, um, raise test scores, it also diffuses downwards with the income of money. And I think it's paramount in the success of the schools not to just aim to, a, um, not just to aim to be sufficient or um, at a regular level of, um, like success, we need to aim to excel. And being at Duke University, a lot of my peers who have gone to public schools, the main difference between their public schools and ours is not that not only are the students doing okay, they're going above and beyond, and I definitely think some things need to change. Um, opinions on that? All right, Merv, that oh, one's yeah. got you I mean, written this, all this over. This one I want, I want this. Well, a great question, you know, the, um, uh, what we're, we're proud about in Red Clay is that um, uh, for the last four years in a row, we've been number one in the state in all the college readiness areas because we've, um, you know, when you look at PSAT, SAT, college readiness, even retention in the college. Uh, there was a report last year that said that 53% uh, of the students that go to college need retention, where, where we were only at 33%. Um, the issue is when you are challenging students with AP courses, and we look, we get, you know, we look at our students in ninth and tenth grade and start challenging them to take AP courses. Uh, we're offering 12 dual enrollment courses, IB courses. The issue is, not where they go to school, it's the rigor that you place students in. And the more you can get students to look at, thinking about their future, you know, there's a term that says, they ha students have to own their future. And they have to have an idea of where they're going to go. And so when you have that opportunity to show students that they can do more, you know, one thing I do, I meet with every ninth and 10th grade class in our district, and I talk to them about being great. And the opportunity is our responsibility as educators is to remove the obstacles so they can get to the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And the issue of all of our schools is making sure that our students take rigorous courses. We don't have study halls in red clay. We don't, we don't allow study halls in red clay. You will take courses. And the opportunity is that you can take dual enrollment courses, cost you $100. If you can't afford it, we have a foundation that pays for it. You can take IB courses around the world once you get your certificate. You could, you can uh, take AP courses. Uh, we have 58 AP courses in our district. And so the opportunity to push the rigor is our responsibility. And as we continue to do that, we're seeing our dropout numbers at all time low, our graduation rates at a all time high, and we're expecting even greater things as students as they come to our system. And if, if I can sort of follow up on that a little bit. Um, I, I'm a Red Clay mom, and I think Red Clay has offered a lot of great opportunities, but I think one thing we have to think about, especially um, as supporters of Wilmington students, um, I know we've talked a lot about making sure we keep high expectations for students in high poverty schools, but I think it is sort of, there's a side effect to having high poverty schools. I personally think we should work a little harder to have fewer schools where poverty is concentrated. And part of the reason for that is that, you know, you do lose a parent engagement and you do lose a critical mass of the types of parents that advocate for certain types of programs to exist in their school buildings. So, you know, you sort of get these students isolated in certain schools where those programs proliferate and you have a wonderful opportunity if you can access that building. Um, and then you have school buildings where a lot of the high needs are concentrated and you don't have a lot of parents who maybe have the background to know what to ask for um, or to ask for the resources to make sure that that's provided. So I think as a community, the more that we can do to demand that that exists in those schools where people don't necessarily even know to ask for those opportunities um, would be something really positive that we could do for all of our, our kids with high needs. Okay. Well, it is really heartening that so many people have stuck with us for so long. We're officially oversubscribed, but I want to go to one more question over here uh, somewhere. I can't see. Right so, here. Okay. Thank you. Thank Whoever's you. got it. There I am here. <clears throat> Good evening, and thank you for a fine forum. My name is Bill Pearson. I've been an instructor for 20 years at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, University of Delaware. Here's my question. Busing has been going on for 50 years. The purpose of busing was to minimize segregation. It's been a total failure for 50 years. We're pouring money into busing 
first graders 30 and 45 minutes from their home one way. That's an hour and a half wasted on a first grader sitting in a bus. So why are we still busing? Second question, are we using MOOC, the world famous MOOC, M-O-O-C, massive online open courseware. It's going on all over the world. Check with South Korea, MOOC, M-O-O-C, massive online open means free courseware. Every child should have an iPad and have a curriculum monitored locally back in their neighborhoods. We don't need busing, go back to the neighborhood schools. So my question deals with why are we still busing? Total failure. And why aren't we using MOOC, M-O-O-C? And if you've never heard of it, it's world famous, shame on you. Okay, you Lamont much. has uh, the answer. Well, I've never heard of MOOC, so I'm sorry for oh, that. I have. Um, <laughs> one thing I will say is I don't know if busting is working or not, but as we talk about, someone mentioned earlier that we need to um, be national and global leaders. We cannot create kids who are nationally and internationally competitive if they grow up in a segregated society yeah. um, their yeah. entire upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to really, we talk about, I talk about mindset. And it's not a coincidence that as segrega uh, uh, desegregation was forced, private schools popped up. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we need to really think about, you know, what do we believe in? I had somebody ask me, well, Dr. Brown, if, if Eastside is so good, how come you don't have people running out the door? Well, there's a reality to where some of us want to send our kids. And that impacts the attitudes we have as we are interacting with our neighbors. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think we have to really think about um, being an integrated, um, a truly integrated society um, who is really uh, uh, helping to develop um, the right kinds of people who are aware, culturally sensitive, um, and, and supportive of all people of all types. Thank you. As, as a way of a benediction, I would like to give all of the panelists one minute, um, oh. well, for a round of applause, but also one minute. Final thoughts, Merv. Final thoughts, Lamont. Go down the line and let's end with Tony. There, there, there seems to be a great deal of momentum uh, to change where we are, which, you know, there's no Chinese proverb that says, you know, 20 years ago we should have planted a tree. Today's a good day to plant that tree. And so we really need to think outside the box here, do what's right. Uh, I'm just, as I said it over and over again, the resources, we need the resources to follow the students. And that's really where we come together as a state. If we talk about the Delaware way, then let's make sure we do it the right way. Thank you. Lamont. Final thoughts. I was gonna say, if, if, if we don't do something innovative to go forward, we're gonna go very, very far backwards. Um, I've never seen um, such a diverse group of people talking about education to the extent that we are now. But I'd rather not talk about the next decade, every decade, and actually yeah. make changes now so that we can celebrate success um, years from now. Mike. I think um, some often think that some of the, the, the teachers or I were, were just interested in, in just keeping a status quo going. The teachers in my priority schools, in all of my schools, are not pleased with where we are. They want to continue to see work done at the policymaking level and from the grassroots to see that our, our students, our schools that are so tremendously needy at this point in our history are getting what they need to be truly successful. I think that though I haven't been necessarily pleased with the priority schools initiative, I will echo what Tony Allen said that the disruption that this has caused in getting the conversation rolling has been well overdue. So I am looking forward to the continuing discussion, dialogue, debate over what we need to best do for not just the children living in the city of Wilmington, but the children of high needs and high poverty throughout the state. And again, I wanna thank you, the, the News Journal, for hosting this event. Thank you, okay, Elizabeth. I'll try, to, I'll try to be quick. I'll, I guess I'll sort of take the, the last question and say, as a product of busing, I had a positive experience with it. I'm not sure I would label it as a failure, but I think what it makes me think of today and the, the way the landscape has changed so vastly from what it was when that initially happened um, is that it's, you know, it's, it, it's about 
integrating our students is about making sure all students have equitable access to opportunities. And that sometimes I hope that can happen in a neighborhood school, that everyone can have that, that choice to have a strong neighborhood school if they want it, or they can make a positive choice to uh, take advantage of some other option. Maybe they're busing somewhere uh, or, or whatever, uh, but that it's a positive choice instead of one based on fear due to lack of resources in the system. Um, and so I would like to see that. I would like to see everybody being able to make positive choices in an equitable landscape. Okay, David. Yeah, thank you uh, to the News Journal, the United Way, and Rodell, um, and the panel. It's been an honor to be up here with you. Um, the massive open online courses are being used a little bit more, uh, and they are being used a little bit in, in this state. There's also uh, opportunities like the Khan Academy, and I think we're going to see some technological innovation that, that may help us. Um, uh, and, and, and it may be able to free up some funds so that we can do a better job of putting more of those direct human touch resources right where they're, they're needed the most. Thank you. And it's appropriate that Tony have the final word. It is. <laughs> I'd say a couple things. One, um, we need to continue the discussion. One of the things that has been most pleasing to me is the outpouring of um, commentary and debate that has um, come from all of the issues that have happened over the last um, seven months, but the recommendations in particular. We have a Facebook page called Solutions for Wilmington Schools. It has 1,500 members. We are discussing these issues every day, every day. Um, the Wilmington Education Advisory Committee meets every Monday in a school and uh, continues to refine our report. We'll issue our final report at the end of March. And, and after March, what we're proposing is that a Wilmington Education Improvement Commission uh, be established to really oversee the implementation of these recommendations. And I'm looking at uh, legislators right in front of me. One of the first things that came out of our, our very first meeting, and Tizzy and Mike will remember, if we don't have the political will to get this done, trust me, it won't get done. And it's been 60 years. And the final thing I'd say is this is not what Chancellor Seitz, Attorney Redding, Supreme Court Justice Marshall envisioned. This is not what they envisioned. So if, if there is a time to act, it's on us. Let's not miss the moment. Thank you. Excellent discussion. Thank you all. Good night. <laughs>